Let's begin. Meta language. Let's go. Quickly, gentlemen. All right, tragedy. Do we, ever, do we understand everything that says about tragedy in that line? And how does it relate to our play? Who is the hero in our play? No, who, was, who, was, who would they think of as the Jason. hero? Jason. So that particular society saw Jason as the hero. Euripides was presenting some Medea as a, another or an alternative, yes? yes? Because their version of heroism was all these things. Here's all the criteria to be a hero. And one of them says, man. Okay? And you do certain things and you act in certain ways. And we glorify you in particular manner. And we think you're amazing in certain ways. But you're definitely a man. Okay? And you uh, may have killed people. You're definitely a warrior. You've fought battles. You've done certain things. You are a hero. But the hero is pushed to explore some of their beliefs and the things they um, see to be true and is pushed in such a way that they um, are then challenged in their beliefs. So Jason sees himself as the ultimate man and he is the victim in all of this but by the end of the play what is he actually realising? That some of it was his fault. That Well not necessarily it's his fault but he is realizing that, that the way he loved his children, and that's, that's probably really where he was most hurt. In the end, he accepted that their removal from his life was hurtful to him. Whereas beforehand, they were really just almost an exchange thing. They were uh, like a commodity to be passed back and forth, okay? Um, and so his ignorance is really pushing the people of Greece at the time to look at their ignorance of certain things. What do you think their ignorance may have been? Or what topic could it have been about? Maybe about women, maybe about men and their role in society or how things certain acted. Because Jason was a hero and he was revered as a hero as if he had done everything himself. But had he done everything himself? No. And so Medea's role in his... Hero, um, heroic behaviour or acts was not ever considered and that is really Euripides is, is really pointing this out to people okay and remember what I said in the PowerPoint earlier about this particular culture seeing themselves as the best example of democracy at the time and we are the perfect society but we totally ignore half of our society and there are people in our society who we don't really consider that much part of our society in terms of servants and um, to the nurse and the others, the tutor and all those things, they were servants. So they weren't up at the top level either. Okay. Yes, Pat. The, the what, sorry? The you could say it was just a gender roles thing, but it was more of a social commentary on the fact that this particular group of people thought they were the perfect example of how a society could run. You could not make any changes at all. It was that perfect. And Euripides is going, ah, for a perfect society, there's a few issues that maybe we could be addressing here. Okay, and so you can maybe have a think about what those issues might be. Uh, Deus Ex Machina, we've talked, um, you recognise now it's a current brand or it's a game or whatever else it is. I think it's, I've seen it on t-shirts. So I'm assuming it's a brand. You're saying it's a game? Deus Ex Machina. Did someone say game or? Okay, I'm not sure about that. Um, but this particular thing, it was a way to make someone to be elevated to the status of a god. And it was a crane in, on the theatre. And it would lift people up, it was this crane thing um, with pulley systems and whatever. Um, and it was mostly if you were, you were given that particular, um, it's, it's quite a revered role, um, if you were considered quite special. What it did in this particular play was also change the course of the plot. All of this stuff that happened is logical, 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 and she's killed her children. So the logical thing is that she's punished or has a consequence for that. But then suddenly, just as she's about to have a consequence, she's taken away by the gods and sort of rescued from this consequence. And that doesn't seem fair or make sense. 
And so now our modern day interpretation of deus ex machina is that this is a, a literary or plot device where the, the plot has its course changed and doesn't make any sense to you. So The Wizard of Oz is a really good example where she's in the land of Oz and all these things happen and people are killed and she has to do this and she has to do that and rah, 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 this whole event happens and her, she's changed and she's a new person and she's a better person but it was all a dream. Okay, as a drink because you've got her head hidden, whatever. Okay, and there are also those TV shows. The worst, the worst thing to read as a teacher is usually from a year seven or year eight child. They write their whole story, and then you say there's five minutes left, and they go, "Oh, I can't finish my story. I'll finish it this way." And then I woke up. What? Why? Why? No. No. Okay, so that is that, you know, you're in the story, nothing, and then suddenly it was just a dream. It was all pointless. It didn't matter, and there was no point to anything that just occurred because it was just a dream, or it was just made up anyway, or it was actually someone reading out a story they made up. It was pointless, okay? Um, but it was originally this, this uh, crane-like thing. So we're thinking with Medea, the whole story, if she gets away with it, does feel a bit pointless. And so if you're there and you're watching and you're thinking, but she killed her kids, why? And so you're actually leaving really angry and really upset and really annoyed about how you feel about this particular event. And how do we feel about her killing her kids? Not, like none of us are going, oh, I didn't mind that, that's actually fine. No, we're all, so were some of us feeling like we're on her side and then she killed her kids and then yeah. It's terrible, it's horrible, but she had no reasons. Yes, and that's the thing, you repeat, some people are like, I wouldn't do it, it's terrible, she shouldn't have done it, but I can sort of see where she was coming from, but I don't want to sound like I'm saying it was okay because it wasn't, but I can see where she's coming from. And so you're really torn with, she is a victim, but she's also terrible, and I can't actually pinpoint which one it is, okay? Um, and that's the whole point of being human. None of us are perfect. Each of us has a flaw. Each of us has things that would annoy somebody and somebody else might look at us and go there. But no one's perfect, yes? We all have good and bad. Jason is the same, but he was seen as the perfect person. But is he the perfect person? No. All right. Prologue, we know. Paradise, episode, strophe, we all know those words, yes? Now, what information have you got written down there to help you that you could study? Have a look. What have I written in brackets beside it? Yeah. Like, yeah, what, what action is actually occurring in that first episode or the first or third or whatever it is. So remember I said it's not just you saying, oh, in the episodes, because that's too vague. You need to be specific about which particular place it occurs. All right, having a look down at the bottom, which words are we concerned about we don't actually understand, we need to ask questions about? Uh, so sophrocene is like this perfect way to be human. If you are reflecting that, you have the perfect balance of everything. Perfect balance of logic, passion, emotion, um, and critical thinking. Everything is perfect. And so, this particular society, I remember how I said they thought they were the best reflection of democracy and everything at the time? They were really going, look at us, we reflect this. We reflect sophrosin. And that's that ethos, pathos, and logos. Okay, so ethics, ethical decisions, pathos, passion, and, and um, emotions, and logos, logic. Okay, can you see some of the um, origins of our words? In these words here, logos, logic, um, ethos, ethics. And so if you have all those three in exact perfect balance, you have the perfect society. But what is Euripides saying about that? Was that occurring? No. And can it occur when there are people who are ostracized or pushed away? No. 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 And unfortunately, two and a half, or two, you know, two and a half thousand years later, are we there? No, it's, it's a bit sad. All right, next words, anything else? J 
Jamal, give me a word you don't understand. Uh, Trust me, others are, probably don't know it either. There was a word before that I pretended I didn't know what it meant. Diatribe, yep. Okay, so it's, it's it's almost like verbal diarrhea, but angry verbal diarrhea, where you are if you're if you're if it's a diatribe, you're on a big rant, and you can imagine it just is so much. It's a diatribe. It's like overflowing. It's coming out of your mouth and it's not stopping us. It's verbal diarrhea. <sighs> Di diatribe. Okay. So there could be a relentless diatribe coming out of someone's mouth. Okay. So it's relentless means it never stops. And all you're doing is just going, you're going at someone. Will you just do better? You're just not good enough. Come on. And the, and the person's trying to fix whatever they're trying to fix. See, I told you you weren't good enough. Are you still not? And then you think, uh -uh, no. And then you think, oh, geez, I just need you to shut up. Okay, so diatribe. Hubris we added. What about equivocation? Equivocation. Underneath Exodus, equivocation. It's about halfway down the page. So, so it's really got to do with the black and white nature of things. If you can put an, an element of equivocation to something, you can decide quite firmly if it's black or white, right or wrong. It's very clear distinctions. There's no crossing over. There's no melding of things. I can make a judgment and go wrong, right. If you can't put equivocation to it, it's more in this particular scene with Medea. Is she evil? No, but yes, but no. You can't decide. And so that's the problem. We can't actually pick a side. It's very difficult. So it's lacking equivocation. All right, what is the diadem? It's on the right-hand side under the golden fleece. Ones, patriarchal, hero, rah, rah, rah diadem. It's a thing. Yes, it is a thing. Head, a thing for on your head. Yes. Oh. The, what's the special word we call that thing on our head? Flower, thing. Flower thingy? No. Oh the, leaves. the leaves? No. Like a, tiara sort of. a tiara thing. Yes. A tiara crown a type oh. thing. All right. So who has those things? Royalty. Okay, how does Glauke die? The princess. Yes, her name is Glauke, and how does she die, Maylene? How does Glauke die? Yeah. How does she die? Someone does kill her. Which someone? Take a wild guess. Who can help Maylene out here or are you all just enjoying this, <laughs> this car crash? All right, Pat, who help her out? Medea kills her. How does she kill her? With poison? More information, please. Okay, Monique? Clothes and? And the crown, the diadem. No, and it's and it's so poisoned that it burns her. Oh, I thought the necklace. Yeah, no. And the reason why, because the diadem was actually an heirloom passed down from the sun god. That's why Medea had it, and Glauke was so up herself, so arrogant. When she got this gift from Medea, instead of, so let's say if I came in and said, so and so, you're such a good student, I'm actually going to give you my mother's engagement ring. <laughs> and you actually think to yourself, I, I don't think I should take this engagement ring. Or you go, that seems legit. That's normal. I will take this ring because I am that good a person. I deserve my teacher's mother's engagement ring. And this is Glauke. That seems legit. I am that good a person that I deserve the actual God's crown on my head. Now that is extreme arrogance, which is hubris. Because Medea knew that Glauke was so up herself that instead of looking at this gift and going, 
that's for a goddess. I am not worthy. She's like, that's for a goddess. You beaut, on it goes. Okay. Hey, I heard this morning at the gym, some guy say to someone else, Uru, see you later, mate. And I'm like, that is so Aussie. Uru, you go, Uru. Not guru, Uru. Means goodbye, Uru. Yes. All right. Um, we have a couple more on there. I want to discuss eponymous, but then we'll discuss the other words later on. Eponymous and eponymously. Here are my examples. Medea is an eponymous play, so is Macbeth. Romeo and Juliet, Othello. Oh, okay. He's another character in a Shakespearean play. Um, the current TV program Bull is an eponymous play. It's about um, some lawyer, person, psychologist. Can't think of any other TV shows that are eponymous. So what is eponymous? What does it mean? So try and think of what are the common things. Medea is an eponymous play. Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet. Okay, it's not about the characteristics they're showing. It's not about the genre. It's something to do with the people, the person in particular. Getting closer. Starts with P. The protagonist. So, no, they're not, not about the death, because Bull doesn't die. So the name of the protagonist, Medea in this particular case, is also the name of the text. In Macbeth, the name of the character is the name of the text. Othello, the name of the character is the name of the text. It's on the list, eponymous. Yeah. So the show Bull, the protagonist, the main character, the guy who's running the show, his name is Bull. His surname is Bull. <laughs> it probably is a bit of a joke in terms of he's actually trying to work out who's lying or not, so it could be a bad Bull as well. Oh, you're back.